Pat Edwards and Patrice Le Jeune. June are going to talk to us about a tre treasure boxes they've come up with. And um, I'll let them uh, explain them to you. Thanks, Dell, Patrice, and I uh, have been together for 12 years. Business. <laughs> we're, we're both happily married. Um, two different women. Partnership, but uh, only in business so far. Uh, I met Patrice in because of the school in Paris that he graduated from, Ecole Boulle, and uh, uh, he, he came on a visa, got a green card, and now is a fully employed uh, legal immigrant. I've been legal from the start, <laughs> so they um, were looking for someone that could uh, make furniture, restore furniture, and do marquetry. Um, and I was attracted because uh, they had a business called Antique Refinishers that's been going on since 1969. 49 years. That's the dude. And uh, it's also known for some of you want some so old brown glue. And at the same address, there's also the American School of French Marquetry. And that's a fairly unique uh, business uh, and school in the US because it's the only one that promotes a tool that is typically French and Parisian, which is called the Chevalet, and it's the tool I've learned on, and I learned to actually love and think it's the best. I introduced the Chevalet to North America after studying in Paris, and it's a tool that wasn't known in this country and um, it allows you to sit and cut very precise pieces um, in comfort and so it makes it possible to do this work. Oh, yeah. Uh, there are historically five different methods of making marketry surfaces and uh, we practice three of those in general to make a profit. The uh, upper one is what's called the Boole process of cutting everything at the same time so that when it comes apart you have pieces fitting in light to dark and dark to light so they make opposite pictures and it's easy to put together so at our, at our school we teach that the first method um, there's an, a variation of that the clock which is called painting in wood again everything is cut in a packet but only one of the layers is the background and in their other layers are the ingredients to make a picture. And that's what I principally do the most when I cut because at this point I'm kind of blind and I can't really cut very well. So not anymore. Cutting in the piece in the painting and wood method uh, allows me to, uh, to, to continue to make marketry. Uh, it's just not as uh, uh, productive because I only get one surface. Now, if you want to make many surfaces all the same, then you do piece by piece, which is the method we use for these boxes, because we wanted to produce four copies at the same time. So there's four of these and four of those that are identical. So those were typically the kind of pieces we were um, producing uh, 2008 BC. BC. Uh, yeah, that's before the crash. <laughs> So Patrice was, Patrick was producing a lot of painting in wood pieces, but as they are a single uh, copy, it takes a little more time to produce them and uh, you sell only one, so the cost is all in one piece and some other pieces went to the six digits. I was building basically spec homes that took me about six to eight hundred hours per project and before the crash it was fairly easy to find a buyer in the uh, high $80,000, $90,000 range to buy something that I spent 800 hours on. After the market collapsed, I thought, how can I continue to work 800 hours on a project but make it sell? And we decided to produce four treasure boxes and sell each one for $20,000, $25,000, $30,000 each. 
it still takes eight hundred dollars, and we still get the same amount of money, but it's easier to sell at this price point. Because you got to divide the price by four. I'm sure there's somebody here that's ready to write a check, so just step up. And <laughs> Treasure bond number three is undertaking. We already sold only one so far, so we'll put three one more in to go. In the raffle next time. Yes. <laughs> I found this on the internet uh, at a Monaco uh, sale in uh, Christie's uh, sale in Monaco, and it was a, a period box that sold for 18,000 pounds. That gave me the inspiration to make that box, uh, which is this one, and uh, that was the inside of the antique one, and that's the inside of this one. So that's what we produced. Uh, then the second box, after we sold those, treasure box two. And by the way, uh, those were almost all pre-sold before we even finished them. Yeah. I kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> treasure box two, we improved the design a little bit and produced this box. And that's the inside of the antique one. That's the inside of ours. And... Uh, that's what we did. So one of the things with uh, working with piece by piece is we can produce four design, but once you're done with your design, it has to be perfect because you're going to cut from it. And also just to show you, that's what we had to start with. So this is not a copy. This is what uh, Patrick called a recreation. Yeah, it, it's um, an inspiration. You just get inspired by a period and you recreate a piece using the same type of designs uh, than uh, in the period. The one we made. Yes. So drawing is. Um, all right. Is it working? It should. This is a video. Oh. Press play. Well, whatever. Or not. Oh. Well then skip it. Yeah, let's skip it. Skip it. It's okay. It's just drawing a flower. Yeah, the video is on your thumb drive, so I just transferred the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So you, you draw um, uh, your design until it's perfect, and then you need to find a way to make copies. So nowadays it's easy because we have Xerox machine, but uh, before there was uh, that machine that is a picking machine. One of the rarest tools that I have in my business is a picking machine, this tool. I have three of them. There's another one in the background there. And basically it's like a tattooing needle uh, or an old dentist drill, foot power drill. You pump the pedal and the needle goes up and down. It's a very fine needle and it punches holes in paper. And then you use a, a bitumen powder to transfer through the holes onto clean paper and you cook that a little bit and you have a copy. And so that was the technology that allowed the French to produce many copies identical of the design to make piece by piece possible. Because if you don't have many copies, you can't do piece by piece. And the French kept that technology secret. So piece by piece is possible with the picking machine and uh, chevalet because that's the first tool that was able to cut uh, perpendicular. So this is the two techniques, tools that uh, makes that technique possible. The line is a tenth of a millimeter and you cut half of that. Yeah, well, you we'll see you there. <laughs> tenth of a millimeter is very tiny. <laughs> So nowadays, uh, I don't use the picking machine anymore. Um, uh, that's the only, one of the only leap I do with technology. Uh, I use Illustrator. That gives me the possibility to work the line again and again until I'm happy with it. If you use the picking machine, you know that in, once you've done those holes, they're there. So if you're not totally happy with your line, you start over or you have to do compromise. And on big projects like that, it's a lot of compromise and I don't like that. And also with Illustrator, uh, what's the advantage is, is I can choose the size of my line so I can print them dotted like with the picking machine. And for uh, 
it's pretty funny, but having a dotted line makes uh, the accuracy easier. Because when you cut, your blade is a black line, your kerf is a black line, and what you cut is a black line. So having something dotted make it more visible and gives you a bit more precision Since in your you cutting. Cut a line, how do you know you've cut away <coughs> exactly 50% of it, it's still a line? But if you have a dot, and you cut away the whole dot, that's too much. If you don't cut away any of the dot, that's not enough. You have to cut half the dot. And that's why the dot makes it possible. So then we take the drawings, we make usually a dozen or 15 copies of each picture. And we cut up the pieces of paper. And we lay the paper out of trays. For everything that's here, every single piece has a piece of paper. And part of this whole process is the internalization of the design like a musician would learn uh, how to play music without reading the notes. He has to practice over and over. This is what we do so that we can memorize where each piece goes right from the beginning. So it starts with the drawing, then cutting the paper, putting them in place, cutting the pieces, uh, touching each piece, putting them in the hot sand. So there's a lot of manipulation and that by the end, if you don't know what piece it is, uh, well, I don't know what to do. I, I think every single piece is handled about 18 different times in the process. And when you have a job, four copies, you have thousands of pieces, that's 18 times for every single piece. There's you there's pick it up with tweezers and move it. On the trigger box number two, I don't remember, but there's at least 1,600 pieces per box. Times four, times 18. So the, you got the, we do it put in tray, so we have the four sides, and then the, um, the top was kind of a little too big for in a tray, so we had one just for the middle, one for the what I call the staples, which are in the middle of the length, and then one for the corners, one for the top corners, and also we had two other trays for uh, the inside two marker trees, so that's ten trays just for uh, handling the pieces, uh, paper, then veneer. Then I grab some wood. <laughs> we call him the tree hugger. And, and this is all sawn veneer from Paris. It's not sliced, it's not cooked, it's, it's raw material from a fifth generation veneer dealer in Paris. I, I was lucky enough to have a lot of money in the 90s and I spent it all on veneer. And because I had every tool, I didn't need to buy any more tools, so I bought veneer. So this is, this is my a sample of the woods before we do this we start with that. And also part of uh, how we've been able to produce those boxes and it's not only one it's four and then four during the crisis is also because Patrick had an extensive stock of veneer that we could work from. Uh, that includes uh, so some veneer but also some bone uh, that we invested on because we don't have enough, but those are bone veneer and bone purfling. Kind of string is inlay that uh, is the white you can see in uh, box number two. It was quite often the case in the 17th century they used bone instead of ivory. The bone was much more accessible and it was easier, easier to cut. And in the box number two we have white bone, but we also have green bones that was dyed um, by our, well, we did it. So my process is to do the palette by laying out all the species. And um, I tend to choose the lower numbers for the lighter colors and then the higher numbers for the background and darker colors. So when I look at the, at the code, I can see the colors because of the numbers. I can see what the daffodils are going to be like because they're a low number and what the rose is going to be like because it's a higher number. I can see the color and I lay out all of the palettes and each of these piles has four pieces of veneer that are identical so we make packets. Also here you can see there's 28 colors on that chart but at that time we had a, a 30 wood uh, choice and uh, for treasure box number three now we have more than 40 different woods available so I don't know how many we'll use total in the third box but we have a pallet uh, over 40 woods now. So on each of those packets, we have to glue the paper that goes for that color and uh, cut out those pieces. And 
precision is key as each piece is cut separately and then the background you cut the cavity uh, if it's too big it will never fit if it's too small you'll have a lot of gaps so, so in other words you cut away the outside half of the line for all the inside pieces and on the background you cut away the inside half of the line and therefore it fits piece of cake that's for a perfect fit <laughs> That's about uh, uh, half a day work of cutting. So it's not that much, but it's plenty of work. Uh, so you do that twice a day. And we use the optimizer a lot. Well, I have glasses now, so I don't use them that much. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the layout of uh, the one of the inside marquetry. So they are put back in the in the tray once they are cut, uh, the same way we put the paper in an exploded view. Then it's time to look at the shading. So you, this is a little too artistic and that's the trigger box number one. Uh, but it gives you a map to where you're going to apply the shading. And this is done with different techniques. So that's, that's the result. Okay. You know, yeah, this uh, sand I brought back from Fulton Blue and uh, Customs TSA, they, 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 they have me on their radar. <laughs> I actually asked my mother to send me some more by mail because um, we, we were yeah. kind of running low and that was opened by TSA. They opened it, they spilled, they didn't close it back up and there was a trail of sand. So I only have a half my sand. It's a very, very fine sand, and we heat it up to uh, uh, quite a high temperature. So the, there's different techniques. One is dipping, so you just dip uh, the piece in hot sand, and I will uh, kind of burn, it's called burning the wood, uh, shading, sh uh, shading, yes. It takes about 30 seconds at the most for sawn veneer. Yes, with slice it goes too fast. Um, the straighter you put it, the shorter your shadow is, and if you put more angle, you'll have a, a longer shadow. Um, that gives you uh, a lot of possibilities, but for inside curves, like here, yeah. uh, this cannot, if you want to put shading here, you cannot because, well, the line will scorch those parts before you even start putting shading at the right place, so you use spooning. Spooning is not what you think. <laughs> I like spooning uh, because you can actually bring details. There's other techniques that you can use, uh, the, but, but the fennel or other things, but spooning and uh, uh, dipping are the two main. And you can see the difference between the just with dipping, that's all I can do, and here with the spoon you can add a little bit there following the map. So there's uh, the four layers of uh, the birds, are those two different ones? Yes, there's the inside of the box and, oops, inside of the box and the inside of the top. Because we've got two different birds in here. So once you're done cutting all your pieces, you do the shading, and then it's time to cut the background. Now, on this, you can see these little red lines. Those are called bridges, because there's areas of the background which are not connected to the outside background. They're just floating background pieces. Now, we don't want to lose them, and so we add a little bridge, which allows them to stay in the place they're, they're supposed to be until we're ready to cut cut the bridges and, and put it together. Otherwise, you'd have just a big area of the window where the pieces go, so. It also they help to locate the, the pieces in complicated designs. So that's, you take off the plugs, you open your pack, and you can see, see, see the bridges holding those pieces where they belong. That way we know where everything goes, and when we put it together then on the assembly board, we can, and, and we have videos on this, uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, if you look on our YouTube channel uh, and you piece by piece marketry, you'll have a video of uh, putting that uh, marketry together, and that can be a helpful video if you're interested. So, 
So assembly board is stretched graph paper and we put the pictures face down in hot glue and then we plug all the pieces in, which means everything is inverted. So not only do you have to memorize the picture, but you have to flip it and put the pieces in. This one goes here, this one goes here, this one goes here. Um, it's a good cure against Alzheimer when you start early. <laughs> so we, this is the way you cut it, this is the way you put it, it's flipped. So once you put it in the glue, you start inserting the uh, pieces, and then when you're at a bridge, you just cut the bridge and then insert the pieces. And so here are the two inside marketry put together. You've got the inside of the top of the lid, and here you can see there's a, I put some cut mark to um, notice, oops, where, where I was going to cut it after to put that shape. So this is a uh, called frisage. Will you call that frisage? Yeah, yeah. And there's no American term for it. You know, banding, uh, framing, I don't know. Besides, what, what they did. So we use also some veneer. Uh, that tulip was a 19th century cut. Um, so cut in the 19th century that we bought from France. Yeah, we used antique veneers. Even the veneer is antique. Uh, and this is all done with hand saw and uh, veneer saw. Um, and, and the banding are cut by hand also because there is no, no stock existing for those sizes in some veneer. So when we made the boxes themselves, if you have dovetails, no matter what, they will telegraph through the veneer at some point and, and uh, it will stick out. So all of these boxes are made with solid material which has a fully blind dovetail on all the corners. That's the fully blind dovetail. So when the dovetails are done, we uh, veneer the inside and we like to uh, do the inside of the boxes first because we like to have everything finished inside when we glue it together. You can't polish inside here. You have to have it taken apart to polish it. So in that case, uh, we, we did the, the partition in solid blood wood. The inside was veneered with blood wood. Here you can see the marquetry panels. At the same time, we made all the outside skins and started working on the top. So the top had a little difficulty uh, around here where the mark tree looks like it goes under the white purfling, the bone purfling, and goes back on top of it. And so the difficulty was uh, impossibility to cut the bone to the shape first and bend it. Um, it's almost impossible to do. So what we decided to do was to uh, insert, uh, cut the top in two parts. The first step, part to put the white uh, bone inlay on it and uh, then rebuild the pack together and um, uh, cut the bone inlay at that time. So we put the first pack together with that drawing on and then we used um, some location crude possibilities here in the corners and we clamped it and drilled through so in the four corners where we knew the waste will be. So that gave us the possibility by having holes there to rebuild the packs afterward. So in other words the top packet was cut twice. Cut, taken apart, reassembled and cut again. So that's the first cutting with some bridges for the bone inlay. Then we inlaid it, then put it back together and cut the background with, you can see some bridges again. The nails you notice are all in the uh, uh, inside pieces, which is the waist. And then we have tape over the areas we just cut. And this is the first. So this is the piece that goes here, and that's a way to check. Uh, this is the bone, and this is the ebony. So that tells us that we realigned pretty well the packs uh, because it's fairly, uh, it's in place. So there's uh, a bunch of work. Um, 
That's, that's a bit of work, yeah. So those are the top view from two different angle, and that's the station from inlaying. So we have the glue pot. I, I need to mention that the training that I received, we both received in, in Paris at Colville is very traditional. And this is laid out a system which is a historic methodology in the way that if somebody had died at this point, the next person in the workshop could step over and understand where everything was laid out because it's a very, very strict system of organization. Otherwise, you lose everything. You have to know where everything is. And, and so it's a, it's a very, very traditional prescribed methodology. And I have a lot of trouble with students who think they can just throw it all in the tray and figure out where it is later, which works if you have 20 pieces, but not when you have this kind of job. So you have to learn the structure of organization. But it's possibility for someone to take over, but it's not easy because you, at that point, you have not handled all the PCs that many times. So it's, it's harder for someone to take over at that point than for the first person to carry on, so better not crook on the job. <laughs> so this is face up for the background of uh, the top. You can see that there's a paper, you can see also uh, through the paper, the veneer tape, uh, the inlay of bone and ebony. And all the bridges. And all the bridges. And that's uh, put together after. So that was roughly six hours of work per top to put it together. Uh, that's fairly involved. There's a lot of detail, a lot of things to do. It's the kind of job that once you start building the back and you put the pieces in, you, you continue. You just keep going. You know, put it away and come back later and you build it. So you do one a day. You don't want to start one and work for two hours on it. And no. so If it's six hours a day, you do one every day. Also, uh, our veneer, we, uh, when we put our marquetry together, they're on craft paper. So that means that once you cut the craft paper, uh, they, you can handle your pieces of marquetry uh, like this. There, here you have four tops and uh, four times four sides, so 16 uh, sides there. You can send them to someone. Uh, if you don't do cabinetry, you can just actually uh, produce the sides. Then it's glued on the box. And that's our favorite part. You use cold water because it's glued face down on craft paper. When you glue it on the box, there's the paper on top. So you use cold water to dissolve the paper, and then that's the first time you get to see the picture. Because previously, you're working on the back side, on the blue side. Everything is backwards. But when you finally put it down, you get to see the final results. And if you think it looks really nice when it's backwards, wait until you do this and it's appearing little by little with the moisture. It looks like it's, uh, there's a finish on it because of the moisture. It's, just, mm -hmm. it's our favorite part. So here we have the entire boxes, four boxes, all the inside surface area ready to be polished. It all fits together dry. Everything is, you know, no, no more adjustments. So all the veneer lines up inside everything, and we just fresh polish that. So that's only one of the two tables because you you see there's a couple of pieces missing. So we had two tables full, and uh, we do French polish. So that's what we like for pore por por filling, is when all the pores are really really filled and you have that good color. And then once it's all French polish, the uh, the inside is all French polished. We're ready to glue the boxes. Yeah. We use uh, old brown blue uh, because it cleans up easy with cold water and it doesn't affect the polish. I also give you a little more time to put the box together. High glue is, is better. Uh, you can clean it with cold water, but old brown glue gives a little more open time. So when you have something with that complicated, you want the open time. Oh, then we uh, developed a, a a secret escapement from this box, which means if you push here, just here, a tray comes out. So, in the entire inside of the box, it's solid, but there's a soft spot. And, and 
one spot. And that's when the train comes out, and then we have our card on the back. We have, um, uh, yes, we have our card pressed, a uh, little pressed today is glued under the tray. So this is just a, a very easy way to do it. It's low tech uh, with springs and things. We have a slides on that later on. Um, but you can see the four boxes glued together, uh, ready to go. All the inside is finished, but the outside is still a little crude. And uh, this is uh, this is the cleaning of the paper of the top. And we made a video. Of the, the top we glued with hot high glue, and we made a video on uh, how to glue with uh, hot high glue. So you notice that um, it doesn't have the banding around it. This is very typical. We glue the field in the press, and then we build the box together. And then for the corners, we add in the banding at the end, the edging. This is typical of what was done at the period. So if your marker just slides slightly, then it's not a problem. You, you just put the banding afterwards. So this is the box all glued with the banding on all sides and the tray without the gilt leather yet, but with the banding added on. Yeah. And that banding hides the, uh, the tray. So this is the escapement. Um, it's, it's taken from traditional French work um, I've done a lot of antiques that have the same system. There's springs which push the, the tray forward and there's a uh, up and down uh, metal catch that hooks into that plate on the bottom of the tray so that it easily opens and closes. The thing about this kind of system is you don't want it complicated. You want it to close and open repeatedly without any fiddling around. It has to be basically a simple system. So then it's like usual sanding, the favorite part of everybody, I guess. Yeah. And finishing French polish again. A lot of marquetry is surfaced with a scraper before it's sanded to get a flat surface because if you try and sand all these different woods, some are more dense than others, and you end up with this, you know, instead of this. So especially in that case, you have bone that is uh, dense, so that, yes, there is a, a difference of density and you need uh, uh, scraping is a pretty good idea to start with. Mm -hmm. So um, we, were, we were successful in selling all of box one, all of box two, and that's eight different boxes. One of these is in the Mingay Museum collection. It's donated by one of our, one of our, one of our patrons. And uh, so we both have loved this coffer at the Getty Museum. I fantasize on it. It's, <laughs> you know, when the wife walks in and finds you staring at this on the computer screen, it's easy to explain. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that thing is huge. It's this big, and it's just an empty box. But the marketry on it is quite good, so we thought, what if we made it, uh, you know, smaller? A third in dimension is about uh, what we're doing. And uh, it's inspired by uh, the Getty coffer, but the dimension being smaller, we have reworked the marketry. So that's our next project, is we, I will say, simplified the marketry by uh, I don't know if it's really much more simple, but we are simplifying it. But there will be uh, very tiny pieces, and um, uh, you can find all of the information on the Treasure Box 3. You can find all the information on Treasure Box 2 on all our different websites and blogs. And uh, we are posting picture often on the update on what we're working on. So right now, if you're interested in looking at the progress on treasure box number three, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram and you'll have almost weekly updates. They'll be done this year. Yeah. We're supposed to be done with treasure box number three in September. <laughs> We're committed. So this box will open 
this way. And there will be drawers in here, and there will be compartments in here, and, and uh, it will have the same kind of uh, hardware drawers that open in such certain ways and all that. So that's our box number three. What kind of se secret uh, compartment in that or the tray? Um, well, yeah, the, this top part will have a mirror, and there's a way to get behind the mirror. This will have a till, and there's a way to get under the till. And inside there will be places where the drawers will pop out. What kind of wood is it? We used to move down the uh, For this box, we're going to switch to a 17th century wood that's extremely rare called ferrol. It's chocolate brown in color. Very dark. Uh, the advantage uh, compared to the ebony, it's not as black and it's chocolate brown is a nice color anyway, but also it doesn't crack as much. If you notice, ebony always cracks. There's not much you can do about it. But traditionally, it. that's what's used, so you have to deal with the cracking. So. Um, any other questions for you? Is the tray, uh, is that leather that you have on the tray? Yeah, uh, with the Costa Mesa, Billy Mulkey does the uh, leather. That's gold tooling. And uh, so you can also see in the front, uh, the, we hide the, the tray with the white purfling. And is that bone also there, or holly, or anything? The bone. Is that bone also? Yes. The stringing on the side there? The, yes. That's cow bone. It's processed in France, bleached, and milled to a very precise thickness. You can show also the mechanism on that yeah, one. Yeah, on this one, we did something more simple. I have a, a pencil tray. And by the way, uh, you guys want to get rid of some of your olive wood. I know where <laughs> it, would, it would go. Um, so what I did was I made a, a button and uh, a lever that opens this, but it's, uh, and again we got the label back here, but this is, this is just a simple device, it's hard to see. We actually have a video also on our YouTube yeah. channel that shows the mechanism. So. The thing about escapements and, and secret areas is they have to be simple and, and repairable. And sturdy. And simple engineering is best. So fulcrums and, and levers are pretty basic stuff. Especially if it's totally integrated, like on box number two. Built in. You want to be sure it lasts a century or two. Yeah. So you're sure your client don't come back. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to mention was the, uh, I mentioned we had sawn material. This is uh, sawn uh, kaboon ebony. It's 1.5 millimeters thick and it's sawn. What would that be in inches? Sixteenth of an inch. And it's sawn on a machine that was invented in Paris in 1805. Uh, that is, uh, you say it. Si au bois montant. That's the way I say it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It saws the wood as the wood rises from a, from a pit. There's a couple of videos on the internet that you can see. Um, that's the way the veneer has always been sawn after 1805, because before that it was two, two men sawing wood. Um, but. When they developed steam power and they decided to slice the material, it changed the character of the wood completely because now when this is steamed and cooked, the log is changed. And when the knife goes through, it breaks the fibers of the wood. And so you have a, a soft side and a hard side you know, where the wood is, is broken, it's, it's, it's dead. And uh, it's cooked and damaged. We don't use slice veneer except for modern, modern, you know, 19th century stuff. But what we do previous 18th century stuff, we always use saw material. There's really a big difference in the quality and the feel of the wood, even the look, 
because it's just sawn, it's solid wood, and that's a big difference uh, between a solid wood that is pristine and something that has been steamed and sheared. And this is a, an example of a student project um, in sliced wood, which is on craft paper. So this is the actual front, the base of the veneer marquetry. It's built on this paper from the back side, and so I could I could put I could sell this to a cabinet maker, and he could glue it down like a laminate, and then clean off the paper and have a picture. And uh, so that's why we have to use a hot protein glue because the glue won't stain the wood or damage the wood since it's all over the front of the piece. And it's reversible with the cold water, we can clean off the glue. And so you couldn't do this with a modern glue. It has to be a, a protein glue. And some other workshop they use, uh, they, they mount the marquetry on uh, tape, like blue tape. But you cannot actually uh, put as much pressure when you build, you build your, um, your marquetry panel. So you need less accuracy, you cannot be as tight. That's my feeling at least. Uh, so if you want to have a very tight marquetry, if you want to have very, no gap almost, uh, then the craft paper and doing it on assembly board is critical. As I say, I have nothing against technology, I use Illustrator. I have a lot against technology. It's called age difference. <laughs> it's called a degree in physics. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So all, both boxes were made with the roughly 16th of an inch veneer? Yes, inside and out. And the core is an uh, oak, uh, which is about 11 millimeters thick. Plus the two sides makes it about 12, about 13 millimeters of, of wall thickness. So you're cutting packets of four, so roughly a quarter of an inch on machine with that splitting well, we, can, we can cut up to half an inch thick uh, with this tool. How thick was the brass I cut the other day? Yeah, well... Um, an eighth? Oh yeah, he took, he, he, we had to make a piece of hardware. I gave him a piece of brass stock that must have been three eighths of an inch thick. And he went out and cut the piece out with the, with the tool. A, a metal blade, but a thicker one, but yeah. Yeah, an eighth of an inch, maybe more than an eighth. This would be a perfect tool for jewelers as well as woodworkers because it clamps with your feet, which gives you both hands free to manipulate. And uh, it's just a technology that I fell in love with and I thought, why don't we have this here? We have every other tool. And you, so. you have instant control over everything, the speed, the pressure, the weight of the blade on your veneer. You can actually push the blades toward your pack. You mm -hmm. handle the pack in another hand. So you really have control over everything, which gives you like driving. If somebody else is doing the speed or if there's a delay in the speed, like with the scroll machine, or if the speed was not movable, you cannot slow it or put it faster. It doesn't help to drive that way. I was selling the kits, and I really don't like to make this tool. It's too much work. And I finally uh, met a person in Missouri, David Clark, who was a retired woodworker looking for something to do. And now he's in business making uh, shuttleways for people all over the country with our approval, because we did all the prototype work for him. So he has, so you could just buy one of these directly from him, and. Work and take it out of the box, and two hours later you're cutting marquetry. Uh, so there's no more, uh, no excuse to not have a Chevy at home. <laughs> <laughs> I have one in my living room. <laughs> yeah. So what is it used for blades then? We we use a German blade, which is a, a longer blade than you have in this country. It's 16 centimeters long. That's an inch longer than your five and a half inch blades. It's a two watt size. So it's about 11 thousandths by 18 thousandths. And it comes in two types of teeth. The pibico is a skip tooth for most cutting, and the escargot is a full tooth for fine cutting. There's other, other blades available, but the length is really something that, uh, for me, also helps the precision. Uh, it's like trying to cut with a very small saw, or having a longer saw with longer strokes. You get a smoother line. Next. A big, big, big difference. So even if it limitates in too hot for the wood um, blades, it's still worth it. Uh, is the core 
the quarter song? The carcass? Yeah, the core. Yeah, as much as we can get. Yeah. You know, we, we cut out the carcass material, sticker it, to get it roughly to size, and sticker that while we work on the skin. So since it takes most of a year to do one of these projects, we have plenty of time to see if the core is going to be stable after it's, you know, surfaced. And we just make a couple extra pieces. Treasure box number three actually is going to be made with uh, French oak. Um, so we are importing the wood, white oak, French white oak. Um, I can't remember the name right now, but it's a, an old cut, um, very old uh, pieces of oak. Yeah. yeah. Is that the same oak that they use for wine barrels? <clears throat> is that the French oak? Maybe. Tronce, I think is the name. This the particular oak, oak is. is uh, is just much better than what we've seen in America. I mean, let's face it, we live in Southern California, you don't have a lot of choice for timber because it's all second choice. Those guys in New England be all the first choice. So, so what, what we happened? just hopscotched over New England to go to Paris and get the, get the wood there. <laughs> what happened during with the 14th reign, so around 1700s uh, and before 1680, uh, the French fleet was absolutely massacred by the British. So Colbert uh, decided to plant a lot of oak trees. Uh, so next time uh, we have a war with the British, a uh, hundred years from now, when the trees are big enough, we have enough to make new boats. And <laughs> we don't have to, um, to play dead. So what happened is they planted all those trees and a century, a century and a half later, when they were finally ripe, for making boats, they were now at steel holes and you know, <laughs> steam power. But those oaks forests are still there and uh, they are old growth, um, were very well maintained forests. Another question, yes, back there. Yeah. The sand shading? Yeah, the sand, for the sand shading, as he asked, um, it, it, it takes an awful lot of electrical power. The, the, the French power source, 220, is, is, is uh, much stronger. 220 volts gives you a lot of wattage. And our 110 on a, on a Chinese hot plate is not going to do it. We tried and buy an expensive German hot plate, and it was almost good enough. Now it's good enough. Now but we're it's using, just uh, good enough. Camping propane burner and it works great. You just get yourself a propane tank and a, and a camping fire burner. You know. Butane. Butane. Well, yeah, but a flame is much better than electrical at this point. You really want you cover it up in a skillet and you just cook it for about a half an hour. And then you test it and it'll, it'll it'll work. So I bought one online that was actually too too hot. Um, so I had to return it and I bought one at um, REI Camp Chef and that was actually the best one. And for the sand, a lot of people are from finding a good yeah. sand. Uh, the best one is from Fontainebleau, uh, so good luck finding it. Uh, but um, one of our students uh, said that uh, reptile sand without calcium in it is a good, a, a good alternative. It's surprising how the different sands work more or less. He thinks it's just sand, but... Very fine with the highest silicate concentration yeah. you can find. What's the highest silicate? Silicate. What temperature, what temperature do you set the sand at or do you vary? Uh, we can't tell. Uh, we test it with wood because you can't get a thermometer in there. It's, it's thousand degrees or something. It's hot. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's 800 degrees. Yeah, it, it's, it's up there. Yes, and it will cook your bones. It's silly to use a thermometer when you can stick a piece of wood in there and see if it's going to burn or not, because that's the point. And depending on the woods, you want more or less hot. So, also the, the when you burn in the plate, the middle is hotter and the outside is colder. So depending where you dip your sand, in the middle at the bottom is the hottest. On the top, on the edge, is the coolest. Don't don't stir up the sand. Put the piece in, leave the sand in layers, you get different heat gradients as you go down. So avoid 
stirring it up. And you pull the piece up periodically to see how it's Yeah, periodically, every five, ten seconds you check it in. <laughs> you've got a lot of energy in this, you don't want to leave it in there. If it's smoked, it's cooked. It's cooked. <laughs> Just no smolder. Any questions? I heard something over here. Anything else? Yes? How do you work with the bow? Well, we had to uh, uh, change the character of the bone to make it curve. So for that, uh, there's different techniques. The one we used on that one was to uh, put it in water and vinegar. So it makes it malleable, but it's it, when it dries, it turns back a little to stronger, but it stays malleable. So you don't want to overdo it, mm. otherwise you'll get uh, gummy bones. Uh, and it will, it will actually stay gummy. It, it melts. Yes. And for the coloring, Don Williams at the Smithsonian suggested we investigate BS, BASF, the company that makes the microlith pigments for inkjet printers. It's a very tiny molecule of color. And we found that that was able to color the bone green. Yeah, there are the traditional techniques um, are different, but uh, for some reason I could not make it work. Do not Google green bone. <laughs> You'll get into some medical things you, you can't unsee. I, I concur. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> but what uh, I like about those um, dyes is they are metal-based. So they will last in time, they are not color fast normally. Well, seen a hundred years. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? I, yeah. Assume you, I assume you don't angle the cut because you're making four copies. No, we don't do that. That's American or British. <coughs> uh, all the work we do in, in French marquetry is with a 90 degree cut, a very precise 90 degrees. And if that's you, what this tool does. If you angle the cut, uh, you're making only one copy because we, you are inserting one piece into another and the angle is just there so uh, it fits without a gap. It also Here. limits how you turn because if you're turning on a cone, you can't get a sharp point. If you have a perpendicular blade, you can just rotate the blade and come out and have a nice sharp. So here... You guys use a lot of filler. Filler? No. No, no filler. We use a mastic. Uh, there is a mastic. Yes, and mainly it's to go into the engraving lines that are part of the decoration. Mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, they, they help the reading of a, of, a, of a leaf or a petal by giving it volume. So the engraving line plus the shading gives a lot, gives a, a good reading for the volume. So they are essential. But there are, there's a hole there, so what we do is we use a mastic. And um, so the difference also with the conical cutting in the piece by piece, you can do multiple copy and you will have no gap if you are accurate. So that's kind of the thing with it. You need accuracy. The bird. This was done by a student of ours and you can see there's no gaps. Was there a mastic and a filler? Does that show? Yes. And you can the mastic is um, hot glue and hot water and a very fine hand sanded uh, dust, wood dust, like Cuban mahogany, 220 grit by hand, filtered. And, and you can see in the leaves that there is uh, engraving lines and that's where the mastic right. goes in and it gives a little reading and... Okay, right here you can see a little gap. See that one, Patrice showed up. Uh, Oh, yeah. At the top of the cut. Here. Yeah, right there. That's a huge gap. <laughs> She's fired. A little momentary distraction from cutting. But the rest of it fits pretty well. This is a student. This is a person who's only taken two weeks of study with people that know what they're doing. Then she came back for another project, uh, and that's our, our third piece by piece project, which is, the second one is even more impressive, so we didn't bring it. We don't want anybody to know that it's so easy. <laughs> Anything else? Um, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.